Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcasts for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that creates opportunities in life you wouldn't have if you didn't go to college. I am Mark Stucker and I'm a college coach. And I'm Anika Madden and I'm a parent. It is Thursday, March 14th, and welcome to episode number 59, your social media presence in the admissions process. In this week's news, liberal arts college mega mergers, and we're in chapter 59 of 171 Answers, and it's all about what your child needs to consider about their social media presence during the admissions process. And this week's question is from a mom who wants to know how her daughter can stand out in the admissions process after taking a gap year. And Mark interviews Ms. Susan Tree this week. She is the former admissions counselor at Bates College and former director of college counseling at Westtown. And their conversation is, write in the personal essay. Don't miss your opportunity to fill in the gaps and bring yourself to life. Part one. Good evening, friends. If you missed the last four episodes, uh, just to give you an update, Anika and I decided not to do New Year's resolutions this year, but instead to look at regrets. Not any regrets, but the results of a study at Cornell, 1,565-year-olds who shared their biggest regrets in life. And we're looking at these so we can learn and not make the same mistakes. Now, here's the thing. Anika doesn't know what these regrets are, so she's hearing about them the same time you are, and she's giving a little commentary or two. So, number eight was taking care of the body. Number seven, not taking, ca- not taking enough career risks. Number six, not being honest in life. Number five, spending too much time in life worrying. And today, number four, not traveling internationally enough early in life. Commentary, (laughs) please. You're genius. You're wise soul. Uh, No wise, because I haven't traveled nearly (laughs) anything. I mean, that's a huge deal. And it's just it's just the exposure that some people get and some people don't. But I know the advantages of getting that early on. Um, And that's why I encouraged Jalen to do his study abroad program when he was in school, uh, because it matters. And I remember specifically how impactful that was for him because he was, I mean, he was really moved by that experience, Mark. Um, Like he just had a different worldview on a lot of things. So, I mean, and that was, and that was just in college. So just imagine all the experiences your kids can get when they are, I mean, at the youngest age. So yeah, I totally, totally get that. You know, my aunt taught me you know, growing up young, at a young age, travel is the best educator. And, and so I was fortunate. A lot of our listeners don't know this, but my mom's from Bermuda. So I got to go to Bermuda a lot, which was great. Been there six times. Mm-hmm. Uh, been to Haiti. But just, just, just two days ago, I'm sitting there talking with my daughter. Our regular listeners know she's world traveler. She's been way more <laughs> places than probably Anika and I combined. Right. Uh, but she was like, that's such an American way of thinking. The French don't do it that way. Like. It's just like, you know, you get this global view and it's harder when you get older and you get kids in bills. Mm-hmm. So listen, yeah. listen, parents, students out there, have your child go abroad when they're in college before they're tied down with wives and kids and bills. Go abroad. <laughs> Please. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right. In this week's news, Mark, the title we're dealing with is Liberal Arts College Mega Mergers. And this is found inside higher ed um, Oh, or inside inside higher ed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is by Mr. Uh, John Kroger. And Mark, what I thought was most interesting about this was that it was really written as a philosophical question. And it seemed as though his intended audience is the couple hundred of small liberal arts colleges he cited as being in danger of closing within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what Kroger does is that he outlines these three options for these colleges that don't meet the what he calls the necessary status of um, having a great location, a large endowment and a national reputation. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that he's saying that these schools need to survive. Now, the first option being, you know, what he's saying is that, okay, well, if you don't have, if you only have two or three, two out of three of those things, then you can just give it your best shot and slowly phase out. And the second option, he said, is that you can try to reinvent yourself as an institution, you know, to meet market demands. 
And then there was the final one, which is which is centered around the idea of a mega merger. And he's saying that, you know, it's not the typical merger that you and I would think of or me or another parent would think of when we're talking about two schools com- coming together. The final option is what this are, you know, what the title of the article is, and is that these schools should consider a massive merger and not the typical merger that, you know, one would normally think of where it's just two schools coming together. But he's suggestion, suggesting what would happen if 10 schools merged and played to each other's strengths. So, Mark, my question for you is, what would be your choice out of all of that? Mm. <laughs> if you were one of these struggling liberal mm, arts great. institutions that, you know, are going to are going to die out soon. Um, and what Mr. Kroger and do you agree with what he's saying is that the massive merger and that was the 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 kind of rhetorical question, I guess he put out there was that it would never happen is mm-hmm. what he's saying. Like, even though it makes all the sense in the world. Mm. Boy, you went <laughs> deep on me like two minutes into the podcast. <laughs> so, so, no, Mr. Kroger went yes, deep on yes, you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so I want to get to your question, but I want to give a little preamble first. First of all, I loved this article because he just, every line of it I, was just so just replete with insight. And I'll take our listeners a little bit behind the scenes. So, you know, Anik and I, we kind of agree. We have this whole written agreement and everything. Like, we make all decisions consensually. We agree on everything, like everything we agree on. And so I was like, Anika. I want it. I love this article. It's short. I want to read it. She's like, no, you'll bore the audience. No reading it. <laughs> so I'm going to be passively aggressive and read part of it because I there's some parts that were just so good. I have to read it. So that's like a, that's oh, a compromise. Okay. <laughs> but before I do that, I want to say something else, which is um, just to underscore the point. So um, just today, this morning, literally. Um, another great Inside Higher Ed article pops up, and the title was Another Small New England College Closes. And this is just a little bit of what that says. Facing a demographic spiral and a challenge in, on its accreditation, tiny Southern Vermont College says it's it will close its doors. Literally, like, I, you know, this mm-hmm. Inside Higher Ed articles come out at like at four in the morning. So I happen to be up at four in the morning, check my email, and I said, oh, this is interesting. We're recording this tonight. And then it says... Southern Vermont College on Monday became the latest of small New England colleges to announce its closing doors. President David Evans said the decision came after the New England Commission of Higher Ed in January caught officials off guard with the news that it was considering withdrawing accreditation because of the struggling finances. The college has spent years trying to bounce back from a pair of financial setbacks and has worked to trim its deficit, recently totaling $2 million. And basically, it goes on to say the accreditation announcement prompted college officials to halt the search for new students this year. In the heart of recruitment season, Evan said, putting the brakes on recruitment was the right thing to do. What what that did was effectively doom us. So just to show like how real this is, like literally today, another small college closes. Uh, Hampshire College, wow. a pretty well-known liberal arts college, you know, same same challenges going on. Uh, now, so... um. Here's what the, here's what this article said, and I, I just just totally, totally, totally loved it. Here's a couple quotes that um, just jumped out at me. Every week or two, we hear about a liberal arts college closing its doors or cutting its faculty and programs. Everyone agrees that for the remaining schools, competitive pressure is only going to increase. With declining enrollments and increased discount rates, many scholars have predicted that between 10 to 50 percent of these small colleges are going to be forced to close in the next two decades. And then. This is a quote from the article that was just, I just highlighted this in big blue neon lights. I did aerial bold. Like, it's just, I just loved it. So (laughs) this is what he says. In today's competitive market, the college's ability to survive depends on three factors. Location, number one. Endowment, number two. Reputation, number three. Here's the harsh reality. A college that possesses a great location, a large endowment, and a strong national reputation is going to thrive, right? So the Williams Colleges, the Amherst Colleges, the Davidsons, the Middlebury's, the Pomona's, you know, the Washington and Lees, the Swarthmore's, the Haverford's, the Smith's, the Wellesley's, you know, the Vassar's. These colleges are going to be fine. Claremont McKenna, you know, and I could name others. Um, a college possessing only two of those strengths will face some challenges, but should be fine as long as they have sound and positive leadership. So even if you have two, and you don't have strong leadership, you could be doomed. Now, a college possessing mm-hmm. only one of these qualities, once again, number one location, number two endowment, number three reputation, is in for a very rocky ride with a high percentage chance of failure. And a college that fails all three, poor location, no national reputation, small endowment, 
you are doomed, baby. I mean, he's just so blunt. You are doomed. <laughs> then he says, for those who fall in this category, there is very little hope. No matter how good their leadership is, how successful they are in expanding their value of the liberal arts, the outside world, they are not going to find traction in today's educational market. So I just thought that was super, super deep, Anika. And um, <laughs> and then and then last thing, he does lay out these three options. You know, so option one, stay on your current path, survive as long as you can. And slowly spend down your endowment until you close. Now, do you know what they mean by that, Anika? Did you follow that? Yeah, he's basically saying keep doing what you're doing until you dry yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, but the spend down <laughs> endowment part. So what happens is normally in a, a, a college will, first of all, for those of you who don't know, endowment is like a rainy day fund, a nest, nest egg fund, right? So if you're sitting there, oh, right, let's right, say right, right. college has a $100 million endowment, typically It'll be invested by all these really smart financial, you know, Wall Street types. But they'll invest it pretty conservatively so you don't lose the principal. And they'll draw about 5% of that endowment every year. So off of a, you know, off of a, off of a $100 million endowment, you can draw about $5 million that goes into your operating budget. So you're not so tuition dependent. But when he says spend down your mm -hmm. endowment, you're probably doing a drawdown of maybe 10% every year. And if you're, let's say your endowment is mm. returning 6 or 7% and you're drawing down 10%, eventually you run out of money, right? And he says, this is the option mm -hmm. most faculty and some staff will prefer because it's going to keep their jobs as long as possible, right? So if you do that, okay, we'll draw our endowment down faster than, than, it, than, we're, than it's replenishing uh, money into our operating budget, you know, you might last 20 more years. It just depends on, you know, how fast you draw it down. Uh, so that's option one, right? That's one. You're asking me which one would I do? That's option one. Mm -hmm. Option two, abandon your traditional mission. Try to reinvent yourself by becoming primarily a vocational or an online school. So this is like shifting mm -hmm. your mission. He says this option is going to appeal to some mm -hmm. trustees because it mimics what for-profit businesses would do if they're in declining market share. Like how can you how can you basically see where the wind is going and move in the direction where the wind so you can catch the wind behind your back. He says, however, there are two problems with this, you know, with this approach. First, it requires everyone in the institution to abandon their core belief of the core value of liberal arts. Like you're strictly going in the direction of like, you know, of a vocational direction rather. We've talked before about liberal arts and training you to think and speak and write and prepare you for the jobs of the future. Um, some trustees may be able to swallow this change, but many would prefer to close rather than reboot the school along a totally different path. Per and then he says, particularly if their discipline's not offered. So in other words, you got a trustee and he majored in history, and now you're mm -hmm. talking about chopping off history because you're, you know, you're going to, you're going to do, you know, you're going to have like a computer tech training program or something. So that's not going to be that popular. And then secondly, he says, there's no reason to believe that the new online vocational school with a bad location, limited resources, and small endowment is going to be competitive anyway. So, you know, and so, <laughs> so then the option three is merger. Right now, there are probably 200 small little arts colleges facing potential closure over the next decade. All right. So let me get to your question, Anika. Are you asking me if I had three? Okay. Of those three things, right? Location. Endowment mm -hmm. reputation? Are you asking me if I had two of the three, one of the three, none of the three? What is it? No, 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 no. I'm asking you what what option you would choose in terms of the the the, the university shifting to All try right. to survive. Would you choose the draw down the money? Would you choose yeah. the reinvent yourself, or would you merge with nine other institutions? Okay, so I wouldn't reinvent myself because like you form an institution with a core mm -hmm. value. And to completely abandon your core belief, that's like your raison d'etre, your reason for being to me. So I wouldn't completely reinvent myself. So I would rule out that option. And um, option one, it would be between option one, drawing down the endowment, because there always is a chance that things can change mm -hmm. and you may still be able to survive. Right. But I'll be honest, I am attracted to the idea of mergers. Like, I think mergers can be fantastic. I mean, he yeah. made it sound so uh, common sense. <laughs> well, Anika, I don't know if you realize this, but Georgia leads the nation in mergers. Like, there's been merger galore in Georgia. There have yeah. been so many mergers. Southern Poly merger with Kennesaw State. Armstrong State merging with Georgia Southern. 
mm-hmm. you know, Albany's. I mean, there've been so many. And so um, the problem with mergers is, you know, and here's what he says. The newly merged institution would retain the best 25 percent of the faculty, raising the average teaching and scholarship quality. Each college would name three trustees to the new board, hopefully the best three from each campus. The college could rebrand himself, combining the names of all 10 schools. But he does go on to say, could this happen? Yes. Will it? Probably not. The collective action problems are severe. Faculty and staff opposition would be intense because a lot of people would lose their jobs. Um, but wouldn't this be better in the long run? So I guess I here's um, let, me, let me let me be more direct. If I honestly thought we had no chance of survival, I would seriously enter. I would entertain merger options. I would want to know what the conditions are for us to merge. Right. Right. Um, and so it would boil down to exploring mergers versus the first option. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And I, but I wonder, <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say, Mr. Kroger, you just need to send this on a mass distribution list to all these 200 schools and make them read this and really come up with the answer. Because I wonder, I mean, he says it like it could never happen, but I don't know. I, I mean, well, I, anything's possible. No, I mean, it is happening. Lots of places are merging all the time, you know? No, no, no. The massive mergers, the ways he's suggesting mm-hmm. is that like mm-hmm. if, you know, 10 schools coming together or 15 schools coming together, he's saying that's basically wouldn't happen, but would be ideal for these schools that are in these situations. Yeah, but but that what he because what he's saying is if two small schools that are both rural, low endowment, bad reputations merge, then they probably both will flounder and fail. But what's mm-hmm. happening in Georgia is a smaller school is merging with a stronger school and it's working out really well. Doesn't have mm-hmm. to be this mega merger for it to work. You know, right. it just has to be somebody who's pretty strong to help carry along the little sister. I hate to put it that way. But I, have a, <laughs> but I do have a question for you, Nika. Why are the liberal arts colleges struggling, in your opinion? Uh, well, for the reasons that he named, I would start with, is that they're not well known. Um, they got small endowments, which any school is going to struggle with that. Mm-hmm. And um, and the location. Location is a big deal for a lot of people. So, I mean, I'm just going to stick with the, with the points that he made is the reason why they are struggling so much. So I think there's truth to that. But what I would say, you know, why they, they've been around for decades and decades. Why are they struggling now? And so... I would say it's two things. It's increased competition and... Uh, Yeah, let's say the competition's off the charts. We know that. Increased competition and it's decreased perceived value. So I'm going to give a quick illustration. So Anika, you have your own dessert store. It's called Anika's Sweet Store. And you're (laughs) you're a perfectionist, so you know that food's going to be good. But (laughs) So you're doing business, it's booming, they're coming in, buying the cakes, the pies, the cupcakes, the whole nine yards. All right? But then rumors start to spread. Anika's sweet store is very bad for your health. Ten people get food poisoning. It's all over the paper. Oh, another article breaks out. It's overpriced. So this is diminished reputation, right? Decreased perceived value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, two more competitors open up. Susie's sweet store on the left side of the street. Sweet treats on the right side of the street. Now you got (laughs) increased competition. I can be really corny with this stuff, can I? <laughs> In a good corny way. Oh, it's nice to be. But that's what's <laughs> happening with the liberal arts right now. The, the, the increased competition is coming from things like badges, dual enrollment, online classes, and and the decreased perceived value has come because ever since the global financial crisis, people, you know, couldn't even college degrees weren't getting jobs, and more jobs, higher paying jobs, are going to people in engineering, nursing, architecture business and people that graduate with liberal arts colleges that didn't have a plan, more of a higher percentage of them were doing the whole Starbucks live in the parents' basement. So that's what led to widespread criticism. So mm-hmm. that's where that came All from. Right. So there you go. Well, but you know I'm a big mm-hmm. advocate of the liberal arts. It's just because you, you, uh, you just yes, you are. Yeah, because you need to have a plan. You just can't think of getting a degree as this elixir and you just walk in with your English degree and think that the world opens up. You gotta have a plan. <laughs> you got a plan, it works out great. So our next episode marks advocacy <laughs> for liberal arts institutions. <laughs> for the fifth time, for the sixth time. <laughs> now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are in chapter 59. I say chapter 59 because we have our episode numbers correspond with a book I wrote called 171 Answers, subtitled to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions. And in that book, I just take the most commonly asked questions I get as a college coach. I turn each question into a chapter, and there were 171 of them. And so the book's called 171 Answers. And we go chapter by chapter and hit on a couple points in each of our episodes in 
our second of four phases to each podcast. And so the the book title and chapter this time is What Do I Need to Know About My Social Media Presence and the Admission Process? Anika, what were your takeaways? Um, can I start with that email you told us not to use? Sure. <laughs> <All the students. laughs> and you, you've you done this a couple of times and you come with a new name every time. But I thought this was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> whatever you do, don't go in there with sexy mama 2004 at whatever.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? I have to tell you a story about this one. So I, I had like sexy mama 2004 at Gmail and the original thing. And then my <laughs> editor said, that might be somebody's email. Get rid of that Gmail. I'm putting whatever. Okay. All right, editor. I bow to you. I bow to your wisdom, editor. So that's that's hilarious. You give the I mean, and that's, and that's, you know, that's email contact. Right, I mean, right, I, right. it's still tied to social media, yeah. but you know, the, you know, one of the main things is, which, which is what I've done before is to Google yourself and just mm-hmm. see what you find out there. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I, I'll never forget. I Googled myself a couple years ago and there was some Anika Madden that had this huge <laughs> debt at this technology company. And I was so distraught. <laughs> I kept trying to call them. The number wouldn't work. I was like going crazy over that. You gave me a flashback on that. Okay. And then and and then you went on to a next one. They gave me a flashback about check your online photo gallery. Mm-hmm. Man, I put my name in there. Old stuff from I don't know what. Who posted the thing? Who took the picture? Like stuff that just came out of the woodwork. So I loved your tips on how to monitor your social media. You know, your presence, your social presence on the web. I'm so impressed that you actually took this stuff and applied it to you. You didn't just say. Oh well, this I did is- this years ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. Well, I, well, obviously this is for Janae and Jalen and John at this point, but you did give me some flashbacks. <laughs> we would like to thank all of our amazing listeners for your comments, for sharing your stories, and for the tremendous feedback on how our episodes have impacted your lives. We are so humbled by you, and we are one hundred percent committed to helping fill the void in education around the college admissions process. So now to help offset some of the considerable production costs for the show, we are asking for your financial support. We are very excited to introduce two very nominal levels of support that will allow us to remain commercial free and to meet the various expenses that it takes to produce this show. You can show your support by investing in either of our sustainer gift level, which is only $5 per month, or the enhancer gift level, which is only $10 a month. And if you would like to give a larger monthly gift or a one-time gift, you can absolutely do that as well. So at our $5 a month sustainer gift level, this is what you're going to get. We're going to recognize you for your support on our website. And you'll receive an invitation to participate in a private group video college presentation that will happen in the month of January. And we're going to mail you two beautiful Your College Bound Kit notebooks, one for you and one for your student. And for our $10 a month enhancer gift level supporters, you're going to get all of that at the sustainer plan level. In addition to a 30 minute private one on one video college session with Mark on any admissions topic that you would like to cover. And also an amazing opportunity for a 100 word shout out on the show to recognize the hard, hard work of your student. It's so easy to support the show. Just go to your collegeboundkid.com and select donate from our website menu. Again, we thank you so much for your support, and we deeply appreciate any and all gifts that will allow us to keep going commercial free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I want to say something about social media. First of all, social media is growing, and I mean growing. I mean, we all know social media is growing, but what's growing is how college admissions offices are using it. Um, And so there are four different approaches that colleges use to social media. First is to ignore it, all right? We've talked a lot on this podcast about schools that do what I call admissions by the numbers. Uh, Some people call it formula admissions. Some people call it matrix admissions. The idea is that you're just, you know, looking at at, the numbers, test scores, grades, curriculum, and making a decision. So those schools aren't looking at social media, all right? So one is to ignore it. Another is check it for everybody. So option one, ignore it. Option two, check it for everyone. Option three, check it for someone if they're on the fence. So we can't decide, I don't know, this is like, go either way. Let's check their social media. And then option four is check it if there's a flag in the file. What's a flag, Anika? Uh, a lie? An uh, indication of a lie? No. It's a cons- So this is another one of these admissions terms that drive you crazy, because there's a million okay. of them. It's, okay. just, it's just a concern. That's a, that's a term we use. If there's a concern in the file, we call it a flag. So a flag could be, why, is it, why did the student miss 30 days of class this year? Like your attendance? <laughs> 
So that could be a flag. A flag could be what what happened in the, in the eleventh grade. They just tanked in the fall. It could be mm. low grades. A flag could be discipline. A flag could be, uh, you know, I was on the phone with, with the school today, Anika, talking about a student because you know I do counselor calls, right? And they and the school was telling me why they were waitlisting a student, and I was a bit surprised. And then they started reading to me what some of the teachers said in their teacher comments. Of course, I can mm. never tell the student because that's confidential. But the point is that bad teacher rec was a flag. So those are oh, so a flag. Man. A flag is any concern that is raised in the file that makes you question whether the person would be a strong addition to your school, either academically um, or from a mm. or from a character mm. standpoint. And it could be. I just I just raffled off four, but it could. I you know we could stay up all night just coming up with a long list of them. But so it so in this case, if there's a flag in the file which is cause for concern, okay, let's delve a little deeper. So number one. It, Ignore it. Number two, check it for everyone. Three, check it if someone's on the fence. Three, if there's a flag. Those are the four. But it's growing. And I want to read an article. Now, this article was, it came out, Nisha was, Nika, and Nika's like, these articles, reading, you're killing me with the articles. But I promise you this one's short. You're not going to read the whole thing. No, I'm not. It's very short. Because <laughs> I don't want to deal with you after the podcast is over. Like over a month. Because this was just so good. So this is an article that came out in the Chronicle, which is the name of Duke's newspaper, uh, their independent newspaper, you know, for students and members of the organization. I think I've said this on the podcast before, Anika, haven't I? Like, you want to be reading newspapers from the school? Have I said that before? Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. So not a major for sure. <laughs> yeah, because newspapers are not filtered through the marketing lens, right? You get the real skinny. So I tell all of my students, read the school's newspaper. Anyway. So the date on this uh, was December 4th, 2017. So this is now 15 months ago. So check out this, Anika. It's called Admissions to Replace the Common App with Social Media Feeds. Now listen to what it says. And the reason I'm reading this is I just want to show how this is a growing trend. Um, This week, Duke University announced it will be accepting Snapchat stories, Instagram feeds, Facebook timelines, in substitute for the common app form that under what yep that undergrad applicants usually submit when pressed for a comment university administrators said that social media accounts are now a more accurate portrayal of applicant success than official test scores or essays and that wow. and their selfless national honor society service that was sarcastic we're very excited <laughs> about the announcement because it really shows how Duke is staying on the forefront of 21st century education, one administrator said. Accepting social media is just the first of many steps our university is taking to modernize our school's environment for the digital age. And then it says, the Office of Admissions officially will make the transition with the next wave of applicants beginning in summer of 2018. Remember, this came out in December of 17. Rather than mm-hmm. submit the common app, which typically includes recommendation letters, transcripts, resume, series of essays, students will submit. Now, you can still submit the common app to do because this is an option. Students will mm-hmm. submit a link to their best social media feeds. Options for applicants could include their Instagram account, an archive of their 24-hour Snapchat story. Um, and, then it goes on, wow. and then it goes on to say, one admissions officer said, the change would absolutely not decrease the information available for each applicant. Then he says, social media is a pretty spot on portrait of an individual. So everything transfers pretty directly. Instead of reading a bunch of recommendation letters, for example, we can see how many followers on Twitter you have. We can see how many likes you have on your Insta posts. So I I don't want to read any more because maybe this one's so interesting. You would have let me read it. But um, <laughs> but but the point is, I wanted to read it because I think I think I could say, you know, this is growing. But I think nothing sort of underscores the point more than to show this is how progressive some schools are getting with using social media in their evaluation. Well, I mean, they had me for a second, a half a second, a little bit. But when they mm-hmm. talked about like how many followers you have and nah. how many people like, what does that have to do with <laughs> the well, person I, I, as an advocate? I, I, we have, I have 12 followers or 15,000 followers. If I'm great, I'm great. Yeah. So here, here's what that has to do. And I, and you know, I, I agree with you that has its dangers because what happened if somebody just took their account out, right? Like that has its limitations. But do you, I don't know if you remember, I put this in the chapter, Anika, I talked about um, 
Do you remember when I said in the chapter when I said, um, why is it that a school asks Mr. Jones to write a recommendation? Does a school really care about what Mr. Jones has to say about you? Uh, as it, I'm talking about Mr. Jones being a teacher. Mm -hmm. and, and then I said, no, what teacher recommendations are, are what we call social proof. They're like, I mean, yeah, they do want to know what you're like as a student. I don't want to act like they don't because that's extremely important too. But it's right. also social proof that you are – like it's a validation of who your character is. And um, while I think this has dangers, I will many. say this. I see a many in Yeah, that. but I also say this, Anika. I think you can learn a lot by looking at somebody's social media feeds. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to – I don't know if I can write with you on that one, Mark. <laughs> so, well, well, let me ask you this. Well, you are you saying you don't like the idea of them substituting for other things or are you saying you don't think you learn anything about anybody? I don't think I mean, because I think social media is such a it, it is what it is. And, and there's like billions of conversation around how fake social media is. Like people are putting on airs and doing all these extra things to pretend like that, you know, they're projecting a certain lifestyle or a certain level of happiness or a certain level of whatever. That's not true. Right. And so to say that you want to that you want to base your you know, you know when you want to judge someone's identity on social media like that's like alarming like I can't you know people put all kinds of stuff out there that's not people don't even put their rare pictures like people have a picture like my picture now is like annoying me because it's like a, a year and a half years old but you know I'd never take pictures I'm just like oh my god I don't even look like that anymore <laughs> so it's just I don't know that just seems counterintuitive I, I don't I don't well, like that at I, all. I agree with some of what you're saying. I put it this way. Anytime anything is brand new, it always has kinks that have to get worked out. It just does. I've noticed that anytime something's new. It could be when I remember when the Common App rolled out CA4. Oh, my goodness. It was a nightmare. Common App version 4. There's so many problems with it. You know, same for when the 2016 redesigned SAT came out. Anytime something new, so many kinks and problems with technology, all kinds of things. So if you're using a new evaluative tool, it takes a long time to even know how to put things in proper perspective. I would agree with that. But here's the bottom line, Anika. Whether you agree with it or not, the point is, is if it's being used, we want to let our listeners know that, right? Well, true that. True that. So I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't the yeah. best idea in the world is all I'm saying. <laughs> I, so so I, I think I'm in between. I think I actually probably like it more than you, but I don't like it as a substitute. Mm, so yeah. I like it in addition to. Yeah, because because, you know, when you're in admissions, you want as much knowledge as you can and factor it in. So mm -hmm. but I think all the points you bring up are valid. People are fronting on there. You know, you bring some good points up. Mm -hmm. Well taken. Friends, I guess Duke should have consulted with Anika because after further deliberation, Duke decided to drop their plan of using social media the way their administrators said they were going to use it back in the article that appeared in the Chronicle, their school newspaper. But the fact that they even seriously considered such a plan is further attestation that the role of social media in admissions is growing as our society changes. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, our question this week is from Ms. Lori in Minnesota. And she says, my daughter is planning to take a gap year. Do you have any advice for how she can take this experience and communicate with college admissions to make herself stand out? She is currently looking at AmeriCorps. Well, thank you so much, Lori, for this question, Lori, from Minnesota. First of all, I don't know if you realize this, Anika, but this may be the hardest question that we have had in almost 60. It is 60 episodes because we did the jump off edition. We're at number 59, but this is actually episode 60 because we did that jump off, you know, where we talked about our background. So this question, it was hard. You may think it's easy, but it's hard. And let me tell you why. So typically, there's so many nuances and intricacies involved in answering this correctly. So let's talk about how gap years normally. Well, first of all, let me just give a little background for people who may not know, you know, much about gap years. So gap years have been growing. and they actually can be a fantastic thing. What happens with the gap year typically is during your senior year, students apply to a bunch of colleges. And um, let's say, you know, you get in four, you don't get in four or whatever. You pick the school just like you normally would of those four that you like. And you communicate with the college. 
and you ask them if you can defer your admission. Normally one year is occasionally two, but normally one year is one year, right? Sometimes even one semester. Can you defer? And you need to put in writing why you want to defer. Like you can't say um, college admissions officer. I didn't get a chance to watch all the Real Housewife episodes in high school, so I want to, like, binge watch Real Housewives of Atlanta while I eat Doritos, so do you mind if I come back next year? Like, nah, that's not happening, right? Like, you have to, you have, to have a compelling reason. It has to be something that will result in growth. So, But there are lots of reasons that are good. Like, you may say you want to learn a new language. You want to do a lot of community service in an area of passion. You want to work up and save up money. You want to shadow an intern and figure out you're on the right career path. You want to work on uh, projecting your passions. You want to travel and see the world or travel with your band and see if you can make a go of your music career. And you want to um, go to another country like we talked about and get a global worldview. You want to help your dad or your mom launch a business. Like There's lots of things that will be seen as noble and noteworthy. Colleges tend to like it because you come back a year um, more mature. And you have more of a sense of self-understanding and direction. So normally, most of the time, schools will honor that. Like, it's, it does vary case by case. You know, everybody's got their own gap year policy. And, and you, the whole class can't do this, right? So every school's got a maximum they're going to allow. But normally, if you put a nice, well-worded letter, you will be approved for a gap year. But when you take a gap year, what you're going to do is you're going to pick one of those schools. You're going to do what we call deposit, meaning put us put your money down sign a contract, lock the space up for the following year. And they're holding it for you. But what this question is asking is how you can use your gap year to have increased opportunities, more college options. So, Anika, any idea why I say this is tricky to answer? Um, no, not yet. But I do want to take a pause right. and just define the gap year because and I feel like we've talked about this before, too. But I want to say it again, because I've heard more than one kid on more than one occasion say that they're taking a gap year. And that just means that they are not applying or going anywhere the next year. That's not what a gap year is. A gap year means that you've applied to the school, you've been accepted, but you're telling them that you're going to defer your your uh, admittance to a different time. Well, um, well, I mean, a gap year can mean you're taking a year off to do something, but normally the process to request to request a gap year is to request from your accepted school that you want to delay admissions, and so you want them to hold right. your so spot. Is it, okay, but is it a gap year? Because even if let's just say I graduate from high school, I don't apply to anything. I just don't do anything the next year. Mm -hmm. Is that a gap year? So that still is because it's deferring admissions. You're deferring your admissions to do something, but that's normally not the most common type of a gap year. Uh, okay? okay. I mean, technically, a gap year is deferring your admissions. All right. So technically, that falls under the definition. But you're kind of it's kind of a segue into why this is why this question is so tricky. Let me so let me go into the into the details why. So. Let's say scenario number one, the one I laid out, more traditional scenario where you request it from your school, right? So if you do that, Anika, you are obligated to go to the school that you deposited in. Um, you're obligated. In the same, it's very similar to like an early decision commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, in fact, it, school, schools have been known to find out a student broke out of their gap year commitment. And to call the school that they matriculated at, tell them this student made a commitment to us. And I've heard of stories where the original school rescinded their commitment and the other school they were going to rescinded because they broke their commitment. Oh, wow. So, so the idea of doing the gap year to have increased options, well, if you're going the traditional path of getting admitted and depositing, that really doesn't work because you're obligated to go where, to the school that you committed to. So now let's talk about another option, kind of the other one that you were describing. Let's say you don't, um, let's say you don't apply anywhere. So you come out of high school, you go right, and by the way, I love AmeriCorps, love it. Great, great, great organization. So let's say you go and you do this year of service, you know, to AmeriCorps, and now you want to apply to, to colleges for the first time, let's say, right? 
or or let's say you don't you go through and you get admitted but you don't deposit anywhere so you never really obligated yourself anywhere so either one you never committed to any place so you didn't need to request because you never committed to enroll or you just didn't apply to any colleges let's take that scenario why do you think i would say that's also tricky Mm, i don't know so the reason why that is tricky there's several reasons one think about what's involved in applying so you have to get a counselor recommendation you know if it's your more selective schools are going to ask for teacher recommendations counselor recommendations now you're trying to gather that information from a place when you're not there like i worked with a student last year uh, who took a gap year and it was tricky because he had to reach back out to his old school that he's not at anymore, talk to the counselor, ask for a recommendation, contact teachers he's not with anymore. Like there's logistical stuff in there that's not that easy. You know, the, the memory can fade on you a little bit. The teachers are and the counselor are dealing with their current caseload. They've already done this for you once and now they're coming back and doing it again. That's not the easiest thing mm. to navigate. Everything from the transcripts of it, all of that. Further, furthermore. Yeah. I think one thing that people underestimate or overestimate, and I think we've said this on this podcast before, people have a tendency to overestimate how much your extracurriculars are game changers in the process. So something that Deb Shaver, the former dean of admission at Smith College, said when we had her on on episode 18 in her interview, uh, the 40-year veteran of admissions, she said, as a dean of admissions, my decisions are first and foremost academic decisions. I got to keep the faculty happy. So what that means is that the lion's share of the decision is still going to be based on what does your transcript say? What courses did you take? What grades did you get? What are your grade trends? What are your test scores? Test scores, grades, and curriculum. And so, sure, you've now had this other great experience, but you haven't had it that long. Right? Because think about it. If you're applying maybe in November or December, you haven't been into the gap year that long to do something that's so transformative. So, you know, now if you were deferred and you applied somewhere, I would say, you know, you could try with the gap year. It's worth applying. Maybe the experiences you've had, you can weave a theme throughout your application of, of how you've grown. And maybe it's a difference between a deferred or a waitlisted applicant getting in. But if you were denied and you think that going on a gap year is going to change a decision, it's probably not. Your teacher recs are still the same. Your counselor recs are still the same. Your transcript's still the same. Your curriculum is still the same. And also, schools have a tendency to create, you get one shot at a first impression. And a lot of times, schools have policies about applica applicants who apply back again, who weren't admitted. It's just, it's just really hard to, um, you kind of get one bite of the apple. Like, I mean, maybe if you were really close. Like if someone was deferred, you don't know when you're deferred, by the way, if you were like just on the cusp of being admitted or if it was more of a courtesy. Um, I would say mm -hmm. apply, do that in that case. But um, I don't know. Did I say anything, Anika, to help you understand why it's hard? Uh, yeah, all of that. Yeah. So, uh, look, I would say go to AmeriCorps because you want to go to AmeriCorps. You want to serve and you want to grow through that service. To do that primarily because you think it'll get you into a better school, I think that is fraught with all kinds of peril and not would not be what I would advise. Mm, and there it is. Okay, friends, you're having back-to-back -back people I interview that I've known for a while that have played a pretty big role in my life. We had Dr. Dave Williams as a four-parter. And when we do a four-parter, that means that it was so good that we're like, I'm like, I'm not cutting this off. Just keep talking because I just know our listeners are going to love it. And this is a second four-parter in a row. Uh, Susan Tree, someone who played a pretty significant role in helping me to be the college counselor I am today. In part one of our interview, Susan will share her 40 years of experience, 12 years at Bates College, 27 years as a director of college counseling, and now returning again to doing file reading. She'll also share why so many students miss the mark in their writing, and she's going to urge students to not miss what the purpose of their essay is. And she shares what the purpose of this essay is. So I really encourage you listeners to um, listen to all four parts of this. I think you're really going to grow a lot. So listen and enjoy. 
And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, I am extremely excited about this interview today. I'm here with someone I've known for almost 20 years. I'm here with Susan Tree. Welcome to the podcast, Susan. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm delighted to be here. Great, great. Our regular listeners will know that I did a year of college admissions in Texas in the early 90s, but it was uh, more of a commuter school, and it was an underfunded school that actually closed when I was working as an admission officer. Left me somewhat disillusioned in college admissions, and a decade later, I returned to doing boarding school admissions at the Westtown School, and that's where I met Susan, who was the director of college counseling. And Susan let me partner with her um, as an adjunct counselor. I would recruit the students, bring them in, and I'd work with her on their college placement. And so she took myself and Brennan Barnard, who's a friend of our show, uh, and trained both of us, and um, really has just continued to be a mentor and a friend. And I've moved down here to Atlanta, but we serve on a college access organization, and uh, she's someone who I constantly reach out to. So. Susan, without any further ado, why don't you give us your bio? Talk to us about where you grew up, and you have uh, four decades of, ad of admissions experience, so you've got a lot to share with us. Uh, bring us up to speed with your life story. Well, thanks so much, Mark, and uh, my, my time working with you at West Ham was certainly a wonderful, wonderful time. It was great to be partnering with admissions on helping bring kids into the school uh, and also then to send them on their way to an institution that would be a great match for them and bring out their best just as, as Westtown had. And I, I always valued our partnership. Um, well, it's, it's been a, a great journey. I grew up in New York City. I'm a Manhattan girl, born and bred, and uh, went to first public school, then to Friends Seminary, which is a Quaker day school in Manhattan. I was not from a Quaker family, but my father was a friend of Bayard Rustin, the civil rights leader who was a Quaker and a member of that, that uh, friends meeting. And it exposed me to some of the wonderful things about multiculturalism and pacifism and uh, access and, and equity, which uh, began to bring out in me values that have remained important to me throughout my life's work. And uh, that's uh, the short version. I knew I was not a real city girl at heart, although I probably truly am, but <laughs> wanted to go to college outside of the city. And because of my many summers at um, a camp in Western New York State, I decided to go really rural and ended up at a wonderful small liberal arts college on the Canadian border in upstate New York, St. Lawrence University, which, you know, this was a time in history where very few people knew what they were going to major in. You know, I knew I liked science and I knew I liked um, French, but I had no idea what that meant in terms of a professional plan. And certainly, as I, I talk with kids and parents now, that's so much how society has changed from just liberal arts being kind of the wonderful opportunity to be undecided and explore and find out where your your gifts and your interests really were. The kids I've worked with now for you know 20 years at West Ham have really professional plans in mind. And I've, I've come to really respect the pressure that's on families these days uh, to get a return on their investment uh, on the tremendous expense of going to college. It's um, just so important, but my values are so much around young people finding what they're truly called to do and be and uh, the happiness that comes from making those decisions, which is, has certainly colored my experience. My, the first dimension of my career was in college admissions. And while I was never a tour guide in college, <laughs> I ended up uh, working in Maine, didn't want to go back to Manhattan, ended up at a uh, wonderful liberal arts college, Bates College in Maine, which was very similar to St. Lawrence in a lot of ways. But I was there during uh, the uh, 1980s and into the 90s when applicant pools were quadrupling at colleges because they started recruiting both nationally and internationally, and selectivity was going way up. Uh, but I read applications. I was the, the New York Metro Regional Director, uh, visited colleges all over the country and even in Europe, and really learned what a lot of students were experiencing out there in their different communities and high schools. And because of uh, the college's commitment to diversity, both socioeconomic and uh, racial, we recruited. Um, all sorts of different kinds of kids. We were not interested in having a homogenous 
student body, which, um, as parents know, started turning tables on the traditional students who were going to colleges um, in, you know, in the 90s and into the 21st century, where it started getting a lot tougher um, on families because of the great diversification of who was going to college in this country, which, of course, we all feel was long overdue. Um, stayed at Bates for, for 12 years, wrote, pub, wrote for the publication, saw the computerization of the process, um, did a lot of very wonderful things, also completed my graduate degree in uh, school counseling and decided that my heart really was working with the kids and the parents as they prepared for college. Um, as, as selectivity increased, a lot of us in college admissions felt more like directors of rejection rather than directors of admission. And, um, well, I say that with a chuckle, it wasn't funny for a lot of people. And it still is very, kids working very hard, very deserving, are finding it tough going at highly selective colleges. But the good news is there are thousands of fabulous colleges in this country. And as a professional college counselor for 20 plus years, um, it's been a real joy to help kids sort through their options and uh, really self-assess and work with their parents to find um, not just one great college, but but um, uh, multiple multiple first choices, as we say, multiple great fits. And now I've stepped out of school work and deciding what to do when I grow up, <laughs> and I'm back in, I'm back in admissions. And I'm I'm reading applications. I'm an evaluator for a uh, very selective research university, uh, very strong in STEM, um, and very popular. It's a, it's it's the type of school right now that's just extremely popular because it's still student centered, undergraduate centered, but has these fabulous uh, professional science technology programs that are attracting applicants from around the world. So it's been. You know, Susan, there are not that many people that have like a 27-year gap between when they were reading files in admissions to going back. So I I can't help but ask you this question. What has changed and what has stayed the same? Well, the selectivity has changed everything. And uh, when I was in liberal arts admissions in the 80s and early 90s, we were admitting only about a third of the students who applied. And that felt extraordinarily selective uh, because it was a small college and it's what what colleges are facing. You know, now colleges are getting 10, 20, 30,000 applicants and admitting very small percentages in some cases. It does vary according to the type of institution and the program that the student might be applying for. But the what we call selection pressure is has increased uh, very dramatically. It's not just about a teenager having done an, an outstanding job in high school, uh, done well in the classroom, developed extracurricular talents, uh, learned to read and write well. That gets applicants maybe through the first cut at many selective colleges, but then there are four, five, six, eight cuts after that that eliminate uh, absolutely well-qualified students uh, in order for that college to enroll the class it wants to enroll. So the other big change for me, of course, has been the advent of technology, now, how kids find colleges, how they research them, how they relate to the college while they are an applicant. It's all digital. Now it's much less personal. And colleges, if they are so inclined, are trying to keep it personal, but are struggling with that. They're not sure it's worth it. This is a generation of teenagers that's very, you know, they're digital natives. They are used to living in social media and using technology, and um, the personal touch is not necessarily that persuasive anymore. Um, although I have to admit, when I admit a student to the university where I'm working right now, um, part of my job is to write two sentences to include in the acceptance letter that makes it personal. And this is a hallmark. Yeah, it's a hallmark of this school, and we know the research shows that it's made a big difference with kids feeling like the place really knows who they are and, and values them. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. 
let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Some of my favorite resources on writing the personal essay during each of the four parts of my interview with Susan Tree. So the recommended resource for week 59 is what is, in my opinion, the best book I have ever read on how to write your personal essay. The book is entitled Write Your Way In, and the subtitle is Crafting an Unforgettable College Admissions Essay. And the author, Rachel Tour, what she says is a perfect complement to what Susan Tree is saying in my interview with Susan. Now, Rachel Tour wrote another book about 12 years ago called Admissions Confidential, and she's a former admission officer at Duke. And that book was considered really controversial. Some people thought she kind of threw Duke under the bus. But I found her writing style back then to be very refreshing because of her candor, her frankness, and just her honesty. So when I saw that Rachel Tour had a new book, I didn't even have to read the reviews. I was all in. And in my opinion, it is the best book I've ever read on how to brainstorm and how to develop your thoughts and how to write a powerful personal essay. And I just want to read to you one quote from the book. Here you go. The best essays are rarely about how students have succeeded or achieved. You have your teachers. You have your list of activities for that. Excellent essays show the readers how you've struggled or mistakes you've made. They express what you're fired up about, how you think, and they show ways that you have grown. This is the best book I've read on any facet of the admission process in the last 18 months. In fact, I got so excited after reading this book that I put up a detailed review on Amazon. So if you want to read an even more detailed review, just go to Amazon and you'll see what I wrote about the book, Write Your Way In, Crafting an Unforgettable College Admission Essay. We will now return to part one of my four-part interview with Susan Tree on, you guessed it, the personal essay. Don't miss your opportunity to fill in the gaps and bring yourself to life. I know, Susan, there's a lot of things that that you could talk about. You know, we could go, we could really break this whole college process down into different facets and you could come on and address them. But I always um, felt writing was one of your strengths, certainly your letters uh, as I travel across the country and visit colleges. Um you're pretty much a legend in the college admissions world. Everybody knows you. I think you're known for speaking up at NACAC and having strong, passionate views that are based on integrity of the process. Uh, but you're also known for your letters. Oh, you're known for, you. for your your very descriptive letters that you would write in, in your counselor recommendation. And I know just from our work together, um, you have lots of insights into student writing. And so... Uh, really excited um, about that that topic today, and 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 so we're going to dive and do a do a, a little dive in delving into not just writing um, in general, but something I know you're extremely passionate ab- about, and I think it's really summarized it well in a quote that you sent to me. And so just a list there's a little bit of a background here. I will often continue to reach out to, to Susan as a as a mentor and when I need advice on certain things. And before I interviewed Cliff Thornton on episode 30, I reached out. I was like, Susan, help me brainstorm and come up with some great questions to ask Cliff. Um, and, and and so you sent me this great email and, and there were some things you said and they were very profound. So I kept them and I saved them. And, and I want to read one of them because I want to get your comments on it because it relates to our, our topic topic today which is, you know, the importance of you telling your personal story so that you don't miss out on an opportunity in the admission process. So here's the quote. You said, your story is the most powerful aspect of your application, and colleges are influenced by it like nothing else. And so let me just say that one more time in case you're driving, you missed that. Your story is the most powerful aspect of your application, and colleges are influenced by influenced by it like nothing else. So... um. Obviously, that's something that's rooted in experience. So can you maybe share an example of an application, maybe even one that you remember from a long time ago? I don't know if you remember any essays from your time at Bates. I remember a few essays from my time at Westtown. And and um, 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on what made you say that. Oh, well, absolutely. And, and, and I do believe it. The, the first thing I need to say is a, a wonderful essay. First of all, it has to complement the rest of the application. It brings the application alive. It's, it's like the heart, the beating heart in a person's body. It's, it, it's what brings the person alive and makes the blood go through uh, the body. But it, it will never be the reason why you are admitted to college, meaning it, it helps the application reader make sense of all the other information in the application. Just as an interview would, if every applicant could be interviewed face to face and a student would have a chance to discuss his or her application and represent him or herself in that way. But that's, that doesn't happen. Interviews are, are few and far between and they're generally, um, not, not so much evaluative as they are, um, just a, a lower level conversation. But the essay is every single student's chance to help the reader make sense of everything else. So while we use the term story and tell a story, it doesn't mean picking a random event in your life and showing showing something cool about it, a relationship or a an event. It's it's providing context that fills in the gaps and allows the admissions application reader to better understand everything else about you, your school, your family, your cultural background. So in a sense, it needs to be more autobiographical than most applicants understand it to be. I'll say that again, because I think that's where a lot of teenagers, uh, they confuse what the word story means. The the autobiography, meaning the life history, that's actually probably a better way to describe it, gives the admissions officer a chance to know kind of where you're from, what the values were that shaped uh, your sense of yourself, but also what shaped your world, your view of the world, your worldview. So, that's really important to remember because while you may, as an applicant, use a story to draw the reader into your essay and introduce the topic, the topic has to be you and your your life, not so much this relationship or this you know the relationship with your 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 Girl Scout leader or your rabbi or your summer camp. Like I remember writing my essays about what it was like to finally be out of the city and live with, with horses, you know, it was great, but it really needed to be what was making me tick and why was that so influential. So that said, that's, that's probably the making of the most high impact essay that you could write. The other, the flip side of that coin is to demonstrate how well you write. So colleges are looking looking for two things. They're looking for information told in an engaging and narrative way that fills in information that helps them really understand your your backstory and what made you the young person you are at this moment in time. Not a finished product, by the way. And the other is to show that you really know how to write an essay. And I mean that, uh, that, that essays are, are circular. You've got to introduce yourself. You've got to, uh, describe and reflect and conclude. And then you need to bring it around. You need always need to bring an essay back to where it started. So you're demonstrating that you have mastered the most fundamental genre of writing that exists. The one that you're going to use throughout college every day of your life. But also, perhaps even more important, is you're filling in the information to help them make sense of everything else. So, Mark, you wanted an example. And I guess just what I would say to teenagers and parents listening to this is it's never 
the exact topic or the event that you choose to uh, unpack in an essay. It's what you learned about it, what you learned about yourself, and what the influences were on that learning experience and where, where it's going to take you. So the essay can be about babysitting. It could be about climbing Mount Everest. But no one in an admissions office is sitting there saying, ooh, she climbed Mount Everest. Let's admit her over this guy that that babysits for his three younger siblings instead of, you know, whatever. So if you see what I mean, you've got to be careful about using an essay to show off versus an essay to reveal a lot of who you are and help the admissions office unpack the rest of the information. And this is the most serious problem with essays. And I tell you, having read hundreds and hundreds of essays, maybe a thousand essays already this winter at a major research university, applicants are underutilizing this experience, this this part of the application in a big, big way. Big, big way. No, this is great. This is fantastic. And there's a lot of things you said in there I liked. One of the things, I like how you said that the essay won't make or, or break your application in the sense that sometimes when people hear us talk about the importance of doing well in the essay and telling your story and even the emotional connection that can create between the reader and the writer, it's almost like a get out of jail card. Like they've been floundering you know, poor grades, poor testing, poor curriculum. And then they think, I'm just going to write my way in. And, um, you know, and, and, and so, and in fact, right. sometimes that's what the, you know, we all hear, we all have a tendency to hear what we want to hear. So sometimes when people are explaining holistic admissions, right. that's how the, the, the receivers receives that message. Like, oh my goodness, this is great. So I'll make my essay, you know, my, my, my distinguishing feature and, you know, you put it you put it you're putting it in a context that it's part of the broader application that's right it it is and every college decides for itself on how much it weighs how much it values certain credentials right so it's you know some colleges are more influenced by test scores some colleges put a greater priority on um leadership some very writing intensive Colleges and universities, which is a lot of a lot of schools, uh, place a premium on writing, and they look at what teacher recommendations say about the student's writing. They look at the coursework the student's done, and even if the student wants to study engineering, they're they're looking hard at self-expression, at how the student can demonstrate the mechanics of writing. Now. You might say, well, that favors kids who go to small schools and have close relationships with their, you know, humanities teachers. Well, it it's not so much that it favors those kids. The expectations of a college vary depending on the student and the student background. So I read a lot of applications this winter from Texas. And don't ask me why, but that's the way it was. And a lot of very large public high schools, a lot of first generation kids, a lot of multilingual students. So I always read an essay in the context of the student's language background. So writing, writing isn't judged to be good if it's fancy. And in fact, that's a failing of a lot of essays in that students either are using a thesaurus too much or somebody, um, <laughs> I'm not naming any names, parents, but somebody has kind of upgraded the vocabulary in a student's essay to where it, it looks awkward. This is what happens with a lot of international students who don't write a lot of essays in English, is they rely so much on word substitution. You know, if it's got three syllables, it's got to be better than a, a word you know, that has uh, two syllables or three adjectives to describe this is better, always better than one or two. And it's very true. I have to tell you a quick story on this. Yeah. So 
you know, I, I have somebody who uh, is a grammarian and a, and a proofer, a professional um, writer and reader that kind of reads over the students that I work with just for proofing and grammar. And so um, I help on the content side of the writing. And then they come in on the on, so they, I don't know every single rule in Chicago style like she does. So right. so she was reading one of my students essays and and I can't remember the word, but she said that word is a word of a 50 year old. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she said that is she says, I don't know a single teenager that talks like that. So so I went back and I was talking with the parents and then the dad admitted that he threw that in there. <laughs> That's very funny. And it, it shows, I mean, a, a great essay that's descriptive and personal and provides insightful information about events and influences in the, the author's life does not have to be filled with what we always joked around as SAT words. In fact, the student the student will write in a far more compelling way if if they use the vocabulary that they're accustomed to using. So when I see a real, um, you know, hot, hot dog English literature, you know, fanatic reader, and they're using highfalutin vocabulary words, <laughs> there's a good example. Um, I expect that. And I, I look at it that way when I'm reading an application from someone maybe who speaks a different language at home and who uh, has maybe worked, not worked his or her way up into the highest levels of English, but is writing with an honest and true voice where I'm really feeling his or her personality, then that's just as good an essay. I, and Mark, I told you about the example of one of the best essays I ever read when I was in admissions at Bates was about a boy who had to quit after school sports to help support his family financially. And he wrote about working at a grocery store, bagging groceries and some reflections on the people he worked with and the wisdom he gained from really listening to the stories of, of everybody from a high school dropout to a, uh, a coworker with Down syndrome to, you know, some of the people who came through the grocery line and treated him very poorly. It the, the life perspective he gained from that, it allowed him to tell his family, his own personal family history of having to be part of their financial well-being, which uh, colleges truly respect, and why his extracurricular resume wasn't going to be so glamorous. So we learned some important things. In order to judge him fairly, we learned some very important things. But then we had this lovely, insightful, modest story about the worldview he started developing by working in that grocery store. And that was, it was profound. I've read some great essays from kids who've, you know, sailed around the world in a wooden sailboat that they built in their backyard or, you know, literally did climb Mount Everest uh, with, you know, a Sherpa and whatever. And they were, you know, they kind of, everyone said, wow, that's cool. But they weren't better essays necessarily. They they really weren't. Well, I think what's profound about that story is, I mean, that's probably what, like 30 years ago? You know, close to it. If not, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. But you remember yeah. it. Well, and when I was, when I was, when, yes. Then I used it at Westtown because I would sit down and read kids' essays. So these are students at Westtown School from all around the world, right? And all socioeconomic, uh, racial path, paths, right? Great diversity. And they would like s go to some common denominator, which I can understand because they were all living together at Westtown and they wanted to write about, you know, something they learned from living in the dorm or, you know, kicking the winning goal on JV soccer or whatever it was. And what I wanted them to do was write about what it was like to grow up in China and be a girl and feel that your whole family was disappointed because you were not a boy and you were there one shot at having a child. And then you came to the U S and what was it like to suddenly be at a, a school and talk about women's lib and um, the me too generation. I read an essay yesterday. I'm, I'm telling you what the essay was. It was by a gal who's still in China at a school, a, high, a Chinese high school, 
And she wrote about doing some internet research and stumbling on the Me, the Me Too movement to young, among women in the United States. This is not in the press in her country. And it began answering questions for her about the sociology of a cultural system that was eating away at her sense of self. She didn't really know why, but she wrote this essay that had many more questions in it than answers. But it answered a lot about why she wanted to be in the in this country and at a school where there was open discourse about all sorts of sociopolitical issues. So, you know, it was profoundly influential because she's in a competitive pool where everybody has great grades and perfect SAT scores. So for her, it really was the differentiating factor. So here's another quote you sent you sent me, which I loved. And uh, you could almost decipher and dissect this quote and apply it even to that last essay that you you comment on and, and, and show the relevance. So this is another statement you sent. In, in your application, be sure to write with depth and passion about your intellectual life, the life of the mind, whatever that means to you in the context of your upbringing and what you've had available to you. How did you recognize and identify mm. what you love the most about your school? Set your intellectual story in the context of your culture and family. What and who has influenced you? So what do you want to say? Yeah, I said that's that? deep. Wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> it was so profound. I saved it in a file and kept it. <laughs> well, I, I mean every word of it. <laughs> now, but what I think that might do, Mark, is scare people. Because if you'd asked right. me that when I was right. a teenager, I would have said, what intellectual <laughs> Right, life? right, right. Yeah. But but so I think I like the life of the life of the mind even better because some of us don't have well developed intellectual interests when we're teenagers but we've all had a, you know a couple of courses or a couple of books or gotten interested in a subject matter that has lit a fire under us and made us realize there was stuff out there to learn that we couldn't wait way to sink our teeth into. Well, another thing and this is something you often have said in conversations with me and I think this is simple and people can 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 get a handle on this, which is it's not so much about the experiences that you've had, but the impact that they've had on you. And that's 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 exactly yeah, right. I think that hopefully that's, is not overwhelming to to students out there, you know. Well, and, and again, if kids can remember that the point of the essay isn't to impress anybody. It's to reveal it's 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 to reveal what makes them who they are and the person behind that transcript behind that test score were those recommendations. Cause you know, if you're at a school where your teachers and your guidance counselor really knows you well, uh, that's hard. That, that's not everybody. There are a lot of kids out there who say, well, that's not me. I mean, my, my bio teacher knows I like biology and that I, I get a good grade in the class, but there isn't that, that depth of knowing necessarily. Um, but that said, you got to say that. You got to say that. Put, give us, give the colleges that context um, and how, how you felt that fire first burning, you know, in your heart or under your butt or whatever it is about something you knew you want. Like when I was in admissions and I would interview high school students, I never said, what do you want to major in? I think that's more common now, but we hoped that students didn't know what they wanted to major in, but there were five things they wanted to study, and they hoped by the second semester of their sophomore year, they, they would have found their degree program or their major. But I always said, what are you looking forward to studying in college? Mm. You know, so it wasn't the fact like, oh, I'm going to be a molecular biochemist, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, you and everybody else, uh, it, it's like, well, what do you actually want to study and why? You know, you got to always put the why with your answer because the answer alone is never going to gain you any points. Next week in the news, six tips from college admissions pros on standing out. And we'll be in chapter 60 of 171 answers. And we're talking about how colleges view homeschooled applicants. And next week's question is from an American mom of two college-bound kids currently living in Madrid, Spain. 
and she's seeking advice on the admissions process. And Mark continues his interview with Susan Tree next week in part two of writing the personal essay. Don't miss your opportunity to fill in the gaps and bring yourself to life. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenbaugh. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.